I want to open this presentation with gratitude. I am personally grateful for the opportunity to be alive here in this moment when we have the opportunity to innovate and to push so many new edges as a species, called forth by this deep knowing that profound change is not only possible, but that we each have a role to play in making that change a reality. So before I dive into talking about civic innovation and the role of Web3 in applying that systemic change, I just wanna pause for a moment and reflect on where we are as a species. We're inside of a moment of transition, a paradigm shift, a, a turning point, what Irving Laszlo called a chaos window, what Zach Stein refers to as a time between worlds. In this space in between, as one world is ending and a new one is struggling to be born, we have the unique privilege and responsibility of choice, of choosing what reality do we want to create? What reality do we want to leave behind to our future generations? So what I think we all have in common here, if you're listening to this presentation, is a felt sense that a more beautiful world is possible. And that in and of itself is a miracle because there are so many people alive on planet Earth today who actually can't see a path forward out of the circumstances that we feel so entrenched and stuck in. So we are incredibly lucky to feel as though we can change the world. And I think that unites all of us who are tuning in here. To me, it seems like there's a rising self-preservation instinct inside of the human species that's driving us to shift our worldviews and approaches to collaboration as we collectively face this exponential acceleration of multipolar traps that are threatening the underlying foundations of life on our planet. What I think we have in common with everyone alive today, including all of the non-human life on this planet, is that we're here together in a moment of crisis. Our planet and our civilization are ill but as we recognize that illness, it actually brings our awareness to remember what a truly healthy planet and civilization would be. There's this Einstein quote that you may have heard before. He says, if I had an hour to solve a problem, I'd spend 55 minutes thinking about the problem and five minutes thinking about solutions. It feels like we are in those last five minutes as a species of this particular evolutionary eye of a needle, this choice point or phase change, when we're stuck running an old civilizational operating system, at the same time while that system is rapidly deteriorating the foundations upon which all civilizations are built and depend. That's the Earth. So we have this incredible opportunity, but we also have this incredibly narrow window to make profound change. And despite the solution-focused energy in so many of our regenerative systems change Web3 communities, it sometimes feels like that change isn't happening fast enough. So the question I want to pose to you today is, what is it going to take for us to adapt quickly enough to make it through this transition point without fundamentally destroying the substrate upon which we depend, our living systems? And how do we make sure in that process of transition we're going in the right direction, that we're not unconsciously reproducing the same dynamics that have gotten us into these set of crises. Thankfully, we have luminaries like Jordan Hall, Forrest Landry, Daniel Schmachtenberger, Nora Bateson, Vandana Shiva, Joanna Macy. These are people who have spent the last decades of their lives diagnosing the problem, which, as Einstein suggests, is 92% of the process of finding a solution. Because if we have a better understanding of the problem, we're better equipped to build better solutions that address the root of those problems. Daniel Schmachtenberger has described the root of the crises we face as the metacrisis. There's a lot of complex definitions and you could listen to hours of podcasts. But the way I wanna summarize it here is the following. The metacrisis is a set of interrelated crises whose common feature are their path-reinforcing feedback loops. 
So just to give you a really grounded example, in the context of democracy, especially here in the United States, we often see the same dysfunctional behavioral patterns. Elected officials, even the ones with good intentions, go to office to make the change that we've elected them to make using the mechanism of redress and adaptation that's designed into the system of democracy. But by the time they have the power to make that change, they're often already so influenced or inhibited by the incentives of fundraising and corporate interests that they can't make the change we've elected them to make. This is a feedback loop. Sometimes in the context of democracy, this could be referred to as regulatory capture. So you can see that these dysfunctional behavioral patterns actually prevent us from addressing the core dynamics of how our civilization functions. At the root, this is a coordination and adaptation failure. As our circumstances have rapidly changed, our legacy systems haven't been able to catch up and adapt to evolve and address the scope and complexity of our current challenges, like AI or climate change or exponential resource extraction and depletion. Markets and transnational corporations and governments are all failing to coordinate our response. So what do we do? I wanna share with you this quote from Charles Darwin. He says, it's not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent that survives. It's the one that's most adaptable to change. So the meta solution to the meta crisis is increasing our capacity to adapt through coordination. But we as humans sometimes have this tendency to try to mitigate a problem or numb ourselves out and dissociate from the problem or even attack and deconstruct the broken institutions that seem to be creating the problem. But we can see that these approaches actually don't go deep enough to meet the challenges we face. We need to go to the root drivers of our crises and improve our capacity to adapt accordingly. One metaphor that is really helpful in that process is to see that the earth is a body. When we can see and feel the pain of our forests being destroyed, seeing chemical spills, witnessing our public health crises of chronic disease, depression, addiction, and suicide, seeing systemic poverty and scarcity when we know that we have enough resources on this planet to care for everyone, we can see that the earth itself is in pain. And this pain is a symptom of the crisis of disconnection that we can all feel if we choose to and that we're all part of. If we can imagine the earth as a body, then we can see our current approach is much like a disembodied brain that's cut off from the body and from the nervous system, that's dissociating from the signals of pain, these requests for resources, this calling out to bring our awareness to what the right actions for healing would be. And so when we're numbing or cutting ourselves off or attacking those sources of pain, we're not actually able to address them at the root. And when we can truly feel and listen as a society, then we are compelled to create decentralized, place-based institutions that can meaningfully turn the signal of that pain into an empowered response through adaptation, cohesive as a species in creating a truly viable human civilization. Many people inside of our legacy institutions want to make this change, but they feel powerless to do it. So if the bankers and the politicians are just as trapped within these legacy systems as we are, who is responsible for creating the new ones? that are truly capable of listening, feeling, and responding to the pain of our planet and of our species. The truth is, we are all responsible for the planet we call home. We're all inherently stewards as participants in the places and on the planet that we share. And when our systems of collective stewardship are insufficient to empower people to care for our home and for each other, then we hold a sacred civic responsibility to innovate. This is what maturing as a species is. It's realizing that there's no external authority to look to to save us. To me personally, it feels like a kind of dignity and self-respect 
to pick up the mantle of stewardship and care in this particular way. And this spirit of care and responsibility invokes a return to the original meaning of civics. You might think of civics as roads and bridges, paperwork and municipal town halls, but the original meaning of civics stems from an act of service, a choice to show up and care for the life of another for no reason other than a profound devotion to the whole. Returning to that original meaning as an embodied practice in the context of our hyper-connected and globalized world, civics becomes the stewardship and innovation of our systems. To me, this is a kind of responsibility that we as a public get to take for the design and implementation of our systems, creating our own decentralized institutions to meet the public's needs. Because the meta-crisis is a crisis of civics. The systemic coordination and adaptation failures we face require civic innovation to address those underlying feedback loops. As civic stewards, we realize that it's up to us to work together to create the conditions in which all human beings are empowered to meet their own basic needs, to make choices aligned with their unique perspectives, and to share in the benefits of our thriving ecologies. So as we undertake this massive process of redesigning our civilization in this way, it's important for us to create a shared vision of the future that we want so that we can collaborate together and create it. And that's why we use these three pillars of civic innovation. This triplicate of principles forms a kind of structural criteria, a rubric for redesigning civilization. And those are resilience, vitality, and choice. Resilience is the state and the capacity for adaptive self-organization, sufficient to provide core life support function across changing world circumstances. As things change over time, do we have the adaptive capacity to meet those changing circumstances without losing core life, life support function? And so you can see the philosophy of decentralization is inherent to the philosophy of resilience. Centralized structures by their very nature are fragile and non-adaptive. So we need decentralized local infrastructure that allows us to more easily meet our needs locally and adapt to change. Next we have vitality. Vitality is life's capacity to create more life. It's also the embodied state of thriving that emerges from all of the interconnected levels of well-being and quality of life for individuals, communities, and ecologies. In the indigenous Quechua language, there's a word called sumak kausai. I am well because you are well. What this indigenous wisdom implies is that unless our ecologies are thriving, our communities can't thrive. And unless our communities are thriving, we as individuals can't thrive. So we can see how interconnected all of our experiences of thriving are. Vitality has to do with bioregionalism. How do we steward our air and our water and our soil? How do we ensure that all of these different levels of well-being are accounted for in the design of our systems? And the last pillar is choice. Choice is the state of fundamental respect for the sovereign agency of all beings. And it's also the capacity of those individual agents to express their agency and influence their circumstances. This principle means that we're designing systems that support agency, not constrict it or take it away. These are systems of self-definition, where I as an agent get to opt in and choose how I want to participate. This is also the development of the capacity of individual agents to assert their will and influence their circumstances. I'm incredibly inspired by Eleanor Ostrom and her work on the commons. And Ostrom's work really illustrates this principle of choice. Choice is fundamental because unless all people affected by a governance form around the commons are able to participate in the design and application of that governance, we're going to miss something. We're going to not include a particular voice, and we're going to unconsciously reproduce the same dominance culture that has gotten us into the crises we face. 
So with these principles as a foundation or a North Star for the desired outputs of what we're innovating and what we're innovating towards, now it's time to start thinking about how do we apply these principles into action. And the fascinating and exciting thing for me about the emergence of Web3 is that it coincides with the collapse of our legacy systems. And I think we can, we can see that those two things are very interconnected. It's not a coincidence that Web3 is emerging now in this particular time. It's actually the blossoming and unfolding of a vision and a trajectory that was hoped for at the emergence of the first internet, but hasn't been truly possible to implement until now. So I wanna offer you a brief overview of the evolutionary trajectory of Web3. It's definitely not exhaustive, but I think it illustrates the role that Web3 is here to serve in the process of redesigning our systems. So of course, this story has to begin with the Bitcoin white paper, which deserves immense recognition for opening up our sense of possibility. This awareness that money, arguably the core civilizational utility, could be stewarded by a protocol and not by a centralized institution that's corrupt and doesn't have the best interest of the public in its design. Then we have Occupy Wall Street. This was a mass movement that had a systemic theory of change. I think it was a moment of awakening for us as a people to realize that instead of protesting for one particular social issue, we needed to call out the failure of our entire financial system as a whole. And when you combine these two things, I think we can start to see how the philosophy and the approach of decentralization help us go further to the root of the crises that we face. Then we have Ethereum, which as a virtual machine enables us to encode smart contracts, to create governance, to create forkable and composable infrastructure. Ethereum is a kind of backbone or a substrate for systemic innovation. And then we have public goods. Thanks to our friends at Gitcoin, they really brought this awareness of the, the unique form of value that public goods represent. Because they're non-enclosable and non-rivalrous, anyone can use them, and the more that people use them, the more benefit that we all can share. And public goods aren't incentivized by our current markets, but if we can use Web3 to incentivize people to create public goods, they can actually create the highest return on impact. Then we have the emergence of NFTs. And while they were initially seen as a tool for artists and a tool for people trying to trade them to make money, NFTs are actually programmable Lego blocks that enable us to design new systems from scratch. Then between 2020 and 2021, we experienced a global pandemic. A lot of people made some money in crypto. A lot of people lost some money in crypto. But in 2022, we saw the emergence of the impact DAO. This was a structural innovation that used the infrastructure of decentralized autonomous organizations and connected them to the ethos of the regenerative and systems change movements. This was a new kind of organization where positive externalities were actually baked into their underlying intention. They're purpose-based organizations, not driven by profit, creating entirely new game dynamics where multiple impact DAOs would actually invest in each other's success because they shared a sense of purpose. This is a total departure from our traditional sense of corporations and institutional structures. So I don't know what the future of Web3 holds, but I wanna propose in the context of this arc, a new unifying message for people working in this particular intersection. I believe that a crucial evolutionary role of Web3 is DCIV. When you take civics, our stewardship of systems, innovation, our capacity to adapt and transform, and use Web3 as a substrate for creating new protocols, this is decentralized civics. DCIV is a distributed and open approach to civic innovation. It's a method that allows us to collaboratively build systems together. And when we engage in that process, we're creating civic utilities. These are core civilizational public goods. 
And so we use DCIV as a methodology for creating interoperable civic utilities. And when we put these parts together, they are so much greater than the sum of their parts. We're creating a civic hyperstructure. This is the fundamental coordination infrastructure that allows us to collectively actualize. This could come in the form of a governance SDK, an interoperable stack of social operating systems, a Web3 fork of the Taiwanese direct democracy, democracy approach through citizen assemblies. Civic hyperstructures are made up of Lego blocks of agentic systems of care that are composable and interoperable. So in service of creating the relationships and the alignments needed to produce these interoperable public goods, we hosted an event at East Denver called Federated Futures. And we convened it at an interfaith climate resilience hub called Shared Ground. We brought people together from the regenerative movement, leaders in democracy innovation, people focused on hyper-local systems, to begin the process of federating our futures into collaborative initiatives that are stronger together than their component parts. I like to use the example from our friends at Lobby3 and their relationship with a team called Holonym. Lobby3 realized that they needed an identity solution that would meet the requirements for civic tech. And so they started working with Holonym to create an interoperable identity solution that could work with Lobby3's DBox platform, a distributed petitioning tool that would create together an incredibly valuable civic utility through their collaboration and interoperability, where both projects actually needed each other to create the value that both of them wanted to create in the world. And this kind of collaboration is the kind of collaboration that inspired us to create Federated Futures as a space for these conversations between diverse stakeholders from Web3 and non-Web3 backgrounds to engage in the participatory design of our systems together. And so this is really what we're here to serve as open civics. We're using the methodology of DCIV to scaffold the collaboration and to incentivize civic innovation that empowers communities to engage in the participatory design science of systemic adaptation. And we realize that working together at this scale requires a kind of humility, a, a way of being respectful and honoring of each other's role in serving each other's projects. Civics is sacred to us because it's actually the process of making a society that works for everyone. And it requires us to federate many different endeavors in order to create the impact through public goods at scale that we all know we need. It's not going to be one project or one ecosystem that gets us out of the meta crisis. It's going to be the spirit of collaboration and interoperability that moves us forward. So that's why we created Open Civics as an open network and a consortium. This isn't another centralized institution. It's actually a process of networking a consortium of innovators. As an open network, anyone who aligns with our pledge can support the network as a witness or a supporter getting inspired to apply these projects and protocols in the places that they call home. And then at the center of the network is a consortium, a high trust group of innovators who are stewarding the network by raising funds, participating in collaborative initiatives, and sharing their intellectual property through high trust and deeply aligned relationships. And in order to create that trust, we are proposing a collaborative protocol which allows us to bypass the need to create a new institution. We use this protocol to create clearly defined pathways so that collaboration can occur while retaining the agency of all members of the network. So this protocol starts with a proposal process where collaborative initiatives can be proposed and providing scaffolding and rails for this collective determination of shared objectives, what future system equilibrium we're actually all going towards together, what budget is necessary for all of the projects to thrive, and how we're going to create interoperable deliverables. This protocol is the minimum viable infrastructure to enable synergistic collaboration between innovators and their projects. So I just want to give you a few grounded examples of the first three that we're bringing forward. The first 
is citizen assemblies. Citizen assemblies are an incredibly powerful tool that allows us to sidestep the institutional corruption in our democracies by empowering everyday people to work in small groups linked to an online platform that allows us to gather collective intelligence and work with the entire population alongside domain experts who can bring education and help to write laws and policy that actually represent the will of the people. So this collaborative initiative requires components from the non-biased sharing of peer-reviewed science, argumentation and sentiment analysis, decision-making science platforms, onboarding and outreach with influencers and thought leaders, partnerships with existing elected officials, and experts in deliberative social process, as well as facilitators. So working together, this collaborative initi initiative is intended to support the creation of a fourth branch of government at state, county, and federal scales within the next five to 10 years. We're also working on a collaborative initiative around bioregional governance. Thinking in terms of bioregions is incredibly important to help us focus on the scope and scale of regeneration needed to preserve life for future generations. We see a future in which an interoperable federated network of bioregional congresses creates a framework for this scale of coordinated regenerative actions. To achieve this, we need to develop a technical, social, and ecological framework for these new governance bodies, which will require expertise from ecological land stewardship groups, indigenous wisdom carriers, technology platform developers, as well as governance and social process experts. Linking these groups together in a collaborative initiative, our goal is to create a framework for a bottom-up planetary governance framework, whose primary directive is ecological stewardship. And lastly, we have an initiative around creating a governance toolkit, or SDK, because we found in being in this space for some number of years that Decentralized governance and self-organization are actually still very nascent when compared with the advanced apparatuses of centralized power and economy. And emerging standards for these decentralized organizations are often still siloed onto particular blockchain smart contracts, which limits our ability to port our decision-making and coordination infrastructure across communities. So this initiative is focused on creating an interoperable, machine-readable, AI-assisted governance toolkit which is a public good that could exponentially expand the competitive advantage of all the decentralized purpose-based organizations so that they can more easily federate and coordinate across chains and across ecosystems. This toolkit would require expertise from social process facilitators, smart contract writers, platform builders, and would result first in a wiki of governance tools and then an AI-assisted governance bot that could support communities in self-organizing locally and globally. So you can see all of these initiatives are not trying to fight the system. The pattern amongst all of them is that we're creating a new basin of attraction, a new system equilibrium for a parallel society that uses innovation, interoperability, and collaboration to get us there. By linking innovators with domain expertise into a unified network, we're invoking a new kind of Apollo project, where instead of trying to get to the moon, our moonshot is actually an earth shot. We're looking for the solutions that will create a truly viable human civilization that doesn't destroy itself. So in this moment of choice, this moment between worlds, open civics is an invitation, a call for you as a civic innovator to work together to do what none of us can do on our own. Are we going to keep working in silos and walled gardens, competing with each other for funding, not seeing the bigger picture that unites all of us together? What I hope you'll take away from this presentation is an invitation to think about how do we federate? How does your sense of the future align with the felt sense of the future of other innovators? And what's that connective tissue? What's the interoperability, the composability? that we can design into what we're working on so that it can federate and integrate and interoperate with other tools and other processes that we desperately need as we transition from a fragile, centralized, extractive civilization into a resilient, participatory, and regenerative one.